Um, <clears throat> I begin with um, expression of joy for being here, um, seeing many of my old friends. And um, also, Happy Chinese New Year. I guess some people may think fate have brought you here. Some of you may think that fate have brought you here. As a Buddhist, I don't know. I don't think we believe in fate. You know, like predetermined sort of. It just does seem to have a connotation of controlled from somewhere else, isn't it? Some, somewhere sort of supernatural, something beyond you. So, then maybe some of you may think, well, it's your free will that brought you here, isn't it? Again, as a Buddhist, I don't know whether we believe in free will. Buddhists are really strange. <laughs> because free will also seems to indicate you can do things at your will. You are the, what do you call it? Supremacy, is it? You are the supreme. Individual supremacy. <clears throat> I don't know whether the Buddhists, whether Buddhists believe in free will. Well, Buddhists have this idea, notion of what we use the term karma, which is so overly used. I think it's in the English dictionary now, is it? I don't know, at least it's in the Wikipedia, right? Uh, it's a, actually a simply sort of a law of cause, condition, and effect. But you know, fundamentally, this karma is a false. It's a, it's a falsifiable. As um, logical as the karma sounds for some, and um, as sensible, you know, because you know it's it's it's, it's simply a law of cause, condition, and effect. You plant more marigold with a fertilizer, right conditioning, the marigold will come. That's it. That's that's what it is. Karma, the you know the law of karma. But yeah, as uh, as uh, logical as it sounds, as um, sensible maybe, and or even as um, empirical at times, empirical as it looks like, appears to be. But karma is fundamentally falsifiable. Actually, if you are, are you know, those hardline Buddhists, they don't even believe in karma. It's not like an almighty creator, it's not an almighty thing. Um, anyway, 
you are all here. And um, I'm sorry that uh, there has been a little, little bit of uh, karmic consequences before I came, and that had a lot of karmic consequences to a lot of other people. It's quite amazing. Like, um, uh, just one person's uh, sort of, um, I don't know, uh, change of movement could impact so many things. Hotel rooms, air tickets, just so many things. But, as I said, anyway, you are all here. I, I don't know, I mean, some of you are here because you are um, what we Buddhists call karmically in debt. <laughs> I'm in debt with you and you are in debt with me. I mean, fairly a good proof that a karmic debt exists. Some of you have been coming to me for past 36 years, that, if that, is an, not, if that is not a proof to exist that a psychophant exists, <laughs> then there's no other good proof. Um, some of you may have been, I don't know, many reasons, curiosity, uh, or, you know, friends, families, uh, somehow brought you here. Uh, I don't know, um, ads, uh, words of mouth. And others may be uh, mindful, mindfulness freak. <laughs> or, uh, I don't know, meditation freak. And you just want to sort of expand your knowledge on that, probably. That's why you are here. Anyway, I guess you are sort of, you must have some sort of interest in what we call Buddha Dharma, Buddhism, the Buddha's way. Uh, Buddhism is Yes, in one way it's a really, really deep and vast and profound. But on the other hand, it's also ridiculously simple. And this makes it so difficult also. And it's, it's so like the paradoxy of being so, it's so difficult, at the same time it's so simple. This makes it so difficult. And probably it is a good thing. Maybe this is a self-defensive mechanism of Buddha Dharma or Buddhism. Two, maybe about 2,000 years ago, Buddhism or so-called Buddhist, uh, Buddhist would be considered something like, uh, I don't know, you know, how we, we sort of cherish or venerate or value or not value or, I don't know, we look at, uh, you know, like computer scientists nowadays or um, astrophysicists, I don't know, or economists. Mm. That's how Buddha Dharma, Buddhism or Buddhist was sort of um, looked at and different kinds of project, I mean, you know, different kinds of um, projection, I think, 2,000 years ago. And because of that, there was incredible, uh, you know, patrons, like in India, um, patrons who are like um, uh, the Pala, Pala Emperor, uh, Dharmapala, I think his name, he, this is like 2,000 years ago, he actually uh, funded or he basically founded a famous 
Vikramalashila University, which is supposedly uh, sort of in, uh, established in response to um, supposed, supposed decline of another great university, Nalanda University. So what I'm saying is, you know, that's how so-called Buddhism or the Buddhists are projected upon or, you know, seen as. Now it has changed. 2,000 years later, it has changed. Now, if you look at like a, I don't know, BBC talk show with a, some sort of a, in a you know, BBC talk show with some, I don't know, uh, something to do with a current religious affairs or where there's um, panel discussions about um, uh, religion with all sorts of so-called religious pundits, um, then um, Buddhism is somehow put it together into something called religion. Just imagine, you imagine, 2,000 years later, Sydney University gets categorized, oh, that temple, that cultish sort of temple, you understand? Or MIT, Massachusetts, what, Institute of Technology gets sort of put it together into all oh, those, those believers. 2,000 years later, maybe no need even 2,000 years. <clears throat> and its professors are not m more than just some, I don't know, like what, gurus. Charismatic, I don't know, charming, charismatic leaders, I don't know, something like that. That's how Buddhism has become, basically. If you're looking at, um, yeah, so the projection upon Buddhism has changed a lot. And there's a many reasons for that. There's a lot of good reasons also. Um, I mean, many times there's no choice. It's inevitable. There's, you know, the Buddhists, you know, the Buddhists, Buddhists come with this. Look. So it looks really religious. Buddhists, they, they are always fiddling with flowers. <laughs> you know, they're, they're always like fiddling with things like incense. And they have gadgets like, you know, malas. So, you know, all that. And then also, yeah, Buddhism has also lots of stories. They tell stories. You know, hell realm, hungry ghost realm, uh, you know, uh, Sukarvati, you know, like the Buddha realm, reincarnation, you better behave, otherwise you'll be reborn as a um, prawn in next life, <laughs> so that you will end up being fried somewhere in Sichuan. Like this. <laughs> All these stories. So then you think, oh, well, this is <laughs> stories. Sto but stories are important, as you know, really important. But you know, how would, you, let's say, you come from a Sydney University, you are a professor, you are a scientist. Right? And um, really, you, you are a scientist, you are through and through. Um, and you are trying to explain something so important, something scientific, but very important to a kid or uh, someone who has absolute no background on science. 
but you have to do it because it's your responsibility. But even more important, you feel, you care. You have a compassion. You are a scientist with a compassion. You are trying to save, uh, I don't know, disease or uh, you are trying to go to the moon or I don't know. You do it with a compassion, with a care, with a love. But to someone who has no background on science, someone who is a kid, how do you do it? You tell stories. Even the scientists tell stories, isn't it? And that story gets written down by the student. Type, publish. And 500 years later, it gets read. Ah, uh, it's a story. There are many other reasons why, you know, project of Buddhism or the projection of Buddhism is, um, is inevitably changing and changed. Um, after Buddhism got sort of born or introduced or and the birth of Buddhism in India, the host, so the birth country, which actually in India did not last long, by the way, you, you know, <clears throat> it got adopted and nurtured and cradled by Chinese for centuries. I think if you look at the Indian um, emperor who really supported Buddhism, maybe there's 50, much less, I think, maybe 20. But if you look at the list of Chinese emperors or the kings, those who have supported Buddhism, exceeding 200 probably. Even today, China has more Buddhists than the rest of the world put together. But when Buddhism traveled to China, China was not just uh, some barren, you know, sort of, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know. China had its own culture, really strong culture, really deep, strong culture, like Confucianism, Taoism. So when Buddhism came, you know, down the line, the Confucianists, stuff has influence towards Buddhism and probably Buddhism also did towards Chinese. And uh, this, by the way, is very visible, visible, even within the, I don't know, maybe uh, the non-Chinese may not understand this, but uh, within the, uh, the Chinese people here would know that many times Chinese, among the Chinese, they will judge a so-called monk, monk or a nun or a Buddhist. Oh, he's a good Buddhist. Why? Then they will give you reason, number one, two, three, four, five, something like that. And most of these reasons are Confucianist-based. Oh, because he's, he really respects other people. Because he really takes care of the older people, you know? It's okay, but is, is Buddhism all about taking care of, you know, older people? Maybe not. There's something to think about. I'm not saying that the Buddhists do not, Buddhists say that, oh, you should not take care of older people. Buddhism talks something else. Not just talk, taking care of older people or young people or like that, you know. Filial piety is not the most important for Buddhism. And now it has a different sort of, uh, what do you call it? Mm, different... Um, now things have changed, even in China. China has become a very, very materialistic society. Pr presently. And uh, now... I forgot the word, I'll try to find. And this morning I asked a Chinese lady, what's the word?
Now, when, a, when somebody is lazy and when a kids, usually kids are lazy and don't work, don't clean the table, don't clean your room, when the kids are not doing homework, I heard that the Chinese parents scolds their kids by saying, you are, you are becoming forsy. Forsy? 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 Meaning lazy, you understand? Is there something, con, con, you know, like, oh, you, you know, like, you, 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 you have, be, it's almost like laziness and not doing anything is a synonymous to Buddhism. <laughs> Actually, the Australian Buddhists will understand this. <laughs> I'm talking, you know, that Buddhist, you know, Buddhism, you know, this is, Buddhism is one of the oldest, whatever, religion or a philosophy or a path. It had a, it really went through a lot. You really need to know this. And now, mm, also, language, wow. That is a really important one. Language plays a really, really important role. <laughs> okay, beware. Zongsar Kensi Rinpoche is known for making a lot of sweeping statement. <laughs> sweeping statement. Generalization, I totally admit. You understand, a lot of sweeping statement. Um, why do I do that? Oh, you know, sometimes it's good to get attention. <laughs> you know? And also, fundamentally, I believe that there is not, not, people don't know otherwise. Everybody makes a sweeping statement, even including, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. There is a sweeping statement. But let's talk that, about that tomorrow when we talk about meditation. Everything is a sweeping statement. Oh, you look good. Which part? <laughs> the language plays an important role in our life. And many of you here, those who are, yeah, Caucasians, Westerners, Australians, New Zealanders. <laughs> New Zealand, New Zealanders, yeah. You speak English, and I'm trying to speak English here. My English is not good. I'm trying to speak English. Beware for a sweeping statement. English has a lot of Abrahamic influence. English language has a lot of Abrahamic, Abrahamic. Yes, maybe some, maybe you are not a Christian. Maybe you are not a Muslim. Maybe you are not a, uh, what, a um, Hebrew, uh, Jews, Jewish, Jews, but how do you call it? The religion. Jewish. Jewish. Maybe you are not, but you do have Abrahamic habitual habit. You do. I have met pseudo Protestant Buddhist so many, <laughs> so many. World is full of that these days. Language plays a really important role. You may not know it. You may be not conscious of it. But the language has that. And it's deep and it's vast and it's wow. It's a, not that easy to get rid of. When you, when you say good, G O O D, it will have Abrahamic influence. It, will, it is quite different from the Sanskrit word good, 
Pali word good, Tibetan word good. You understand? This is important to know. You need to know this. And by the way, you are not alone. Even those who are not Caucasian, those who are not Westerners, such as, let's say, like myself, I was born in Bhutan. Bhutanese, most of the Bhutanese, one, they have, they have been to, you know, they studied in St. Helens, St. George, St. Joseph, especially, you know, those who got education in the colonial places. They have a strong... So when a Bhutanese, educated Bhutanese in Bhutan, when they say good, you know, like good, what good? Good karma, bad karma, good this, good that. Bad karma, you know. We have to be very careful. What are they talking about? Because it's invisible, but at the same time, really, really important. Plus, we have now Netflix, right? Netflix, Netflix, Game of Thrones, wow. All those relentlessly, relentlessly establishes global meaning of globalized definition of word good. Go Globalized meaning of bad. It happens. Recently, I was um, talking to a Chinese mother who has a small kid, and uh, he wanted a dragon. Wow. Dragon is a, such an important thing for Chinese, isn't it? It's everywhere. But this kid, when, we, when I show him a Chinese traditional dragon, he couldn't understand what that is. He wanted the Disney version of the dragon. <laughs> Things change so much, isn't it? Yeah, globalized meaning of good, globalized, standard, standardized meaning of good and bad. That also is happening. And, you know, this has a lot of impact, by the way, and there's so much things are changing. For instance, just now I met, just before I came here, I met one of my Australian friend, and uh, there was a, you know, like a momentary dilemma, because she lost quite a lot of weight. So there was a momentary dilemma because in places like Bhutan, the response is, are you okay? <laughs> because you have lost so much weight. You know, in places like Bhutan, when you are a little bit chubby, voluptuous, big, then you are healthy. But now that has changed. So, you know, to, to have lost weight is actually good. You understand? So the good and bad, the definitions have changed. So all these changes, how we validate values, how we define the meaning of meaning, um, yeah, basically, it really changes how you project, how you see your life in general. It does, I think. It really does have an impact. If you grow up, if you are one of those people who grow up watching Simpson or Tom and Jerry, and in the Tom and Jerry, there's a lot of Smashing, isn't it? Lot. 
a lot of smashing and, you know, things are falling out. You, you know, a lot of smashing. Have you thought about it? They never go naked or have sex. Tom and Jerry <laughs> or with others. They smash a lot. Well, no, the reason why I'm telling you this is, okay, so you have... So the violence is sort of okay? Nudity? No, not during that time. Not, not with Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry having sex, that's like sacrilegious. <laughs> See, if you grow up in this kind of culture and in this kind of environment, you know, your value system, where you define your value, where you see things, have an impact, of course. Anyway, I'm saying all of this um, because if you read, you know, since, you know, we are supposed to talk about, in the, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to present you the Buddhist view, Buddhist meditation and Buddhist action, whatever. Um, I'm saying these things, be, hopefully that, I mean, um, ideally you have to be open-minded, really, really open-minded. But that's difficult, really difficult. Being open-minded is not our character, not human character. My hippie friends here, I, you know, I have so many hippie friends in Australia. Sadly, they're getting a little extinct <laughs> or getting kind of and there's no lineage holders, why is that? <laughs> Maybe I'm going to the wrong places. But not many lineage holders, but you know the hippies, they pride themselves for being open-minded, I guess. Mm, they're most conservative. <laughs> they're very conservative. <laughs> they are so... Fanatical, actually. <laughs> they believe in a certain values just so much. But anyway, if you can, it would be good to be open-minded. But if you cannot, that's fine. At least you need to know that um, language, not only this time, but throughout. I mean, if you are studying any kind of uh, Indian wisdom tradition, Asian wisdom tradition, basically, or any kind of, you know, Latin, whatever, language is always going to be a challenge. So I think it's always important to accept that sort of reality. Um, You know, as I said earlier, many of you have Abrahamic, consciously or unconsciously, doesn't matter, but you have that Abrahamic habitual pattern. An Abrahamic system is dualistic system. They are proud that they are, they are dualistic, no? Bad versus, evil versus good, right, wrong, no? Like Abrahamic system is, is very dualistic. They are proud, it's very clear actually. Um, it's also more, I think, more Directional, I think it's really good for the direction. Okay, do it this way. Buddhism is not really dualistic. It's a non-dualistic system. So a language, habit, culture that has a strong duality, dualistic, 
thinking approach. And then using that language and that tool to understand non-dual, non-dual system is going to be difficult. So, but I think to have that in your mind as a, you know, as a, I don't know, study tool probably will help. Okay. So, Mm, we have view, I think view, meditation and action, right? Or, yeah. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, add one more. Uh, view, meditation, action and the result. Tawa, Gomba, Jepa, Jebu. Okay. Mm, and I'm going to talk about the result first and get done with it and then we will not talk about it because anyway, um, yeah, so the result first. What is it? What is, what is the profit, right? What is the aim? What is the, what is the aim? purpose, the result, the aim. The Buddhist aim, I want to just, first I will go through this um, all, one by one after another, but um, just a brief one first, summary. The Buddhist result fundamentally is got nothing to do with something to get. This you must write it in a bold letter, very important. Buddhist result has got nothing to do with get, attain enlightenment, get enlightenment, achieve enlightenment. Yes, we say this a lot, we, we use these kind of phrases, language, all, and we have the examples, but remember I was talking about the stories. Fundamentally, Buddhist idea of result is not defined by what you get. Rather, it's defined by what you get rid of. So this, and, and it's because of that, the word like a Buddha, actually the word Buddha has the connotation of awaken, you know, awaken, sort of like dispelling the sleep, sort of, you know, awaken, you know, get rid of the sleep. So awaken. That's really important. That's what Buddhism is, Buddha, Buddha Dharma is aiming for. To get rid of, or to be awakened. Uh, get rid of what? Get rid of mistaken ideas, false ideas, delusions. Yeah. That basically is the Essent, quintessential meaning of the word nirvana. Okay, that's it about the result because um, it's important we uh, dwell on the other three. View, meditation and action. Now, view. At glance, when we talk about view, we are talking about what Buddhist belief, Buddhist view, right? Buddhist belief.
This is really difficult. This is ironically what Buddhism, the whole Buddhist path is really trying so many, many ways to get rid of all kinds of belief. Not to have any view is the aim. To shrug off from all the view, to do, to do without any view, because view is a problem. Fundamentally, Buddhists don't like to have a belief. I think you need to know that. So in other words, fundamentally, Buddhists don't like to have, or the, the aim is not to have any view. Okay? So, why do we talk about a view? Why then we talk about the view? Now we have to talk about history of path. How does a path emerge? When did it start? How, why a path, a way, a religion, a system, why? It's actually very simple. Because we have mind, this is why. And this is really, um, I don't know how to put this, um, you have a mind and you can never ever take a leave from this mind for a weekend, you understand? And forget weekend, you can't even do without it. I mean, you cannot sort of pause the mind for a few moments. Maybe if you faint it, or if you are, I don't know, they say coma, but that's a very debatable, or a deep sleep, or startled moment, so on and so forth, but let's no, not go in too technical, but you have a mind. Is it fortunate that you have a mind? Yes! But it's also very unfortunate that you have a mind. How? Don't you wish that you are a table? <laughs> it doesn't have a mind. So it really doesn't care whether anybody is using it as a table or not. It never, gets re never feels rejected. <laughs> it never feels rejected. Do I look good? Do I smell good? Am I, am I strong? Nothing. But we do, we have this thing called mind and it always ends up knowing things. It always ends up cognizing things. No matter how you try, more you try to not cognize, it uh, ends up cognizing more. You end up being aware of things. And if it is just a simple awareness, simple cognition, simple knowing, would have been so much better, but it's not like that. After the cognition comes, Value, meaning, good, bad, all that, hope. And then it leads to hope, fear, expectations. Whole war begins with this. 
because you have this mind. You, you have this. This is, this is not mystery. Huh? I'm not talking about some mythical <laughs> mystery, <laughs> mystery. You have it. You are listening to me right now. You are uh, no, noticing a baby crying now. This, this thing that you have, that imagination, that you imagine things, I don't know, th things that, you know, gets fidgety, things that get annoyed, things that sometimes get inspired, and you know, you know mind, it, it, it's so unpredictable. You have that. And because of not only you have a mind, the mind always ends up creating different view. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about the Buddhist view and I already told you, actually the final aim is not to have any view, remember? But at the same time, we need to talk about the Buddhist view. And why? Uh, it's like this, um, you know, let's say, and Australians, you know, they're quite familiar with this. Let's say you took a hallucinogenic substance. <laughs> you took something hallucinogenic and you now think you have a horn and you have a tail and you are like, oh my goodness, how do I go to my job tomorrow? How do I meet my girlfriend or boyfriend or how, you understand, where do I hide my tail, you understand? All this panic, you have that. And me, what do I say? Even if I say, oh, don't worry, that's so patronizing. <laughs> Actually, I shouldn't even be saying anything because you don't have horn, you don't have tail. You understand what I'm saying? Even to say, you know, actually, don't, yeah, don't worry, even that is an instruction. You got it? It's an instruction. Don't worry. Calm down. Oh my goodness, it's getting worse. <laughs> Calm down. It's okay. Oh my goodness, that's even worse. It's okay. Don't worry. But then this, you know, all this doesn't help. You have to add more or drink more water, right? <laughs> drink more water. Pet. <laughs> Rub somebody. Caress. Hug. All that helps. Helps what? Helps you to, I don't know, be relieved from this non-existing non-existing horn and the non-existing tail. I still need to tell you some sort of a view. Oh, it's okay, don't worry. It would be the worst, especially if the hallucinogen, hallucinogenic mushroom taker is not an experienced one, not a, you know, disciple of superior faculties. <laughs> if, he, <laughs> if he is not, it would be worse. What do you mean by horn? What do you mean by tail? I don't see it. Come on, don't kid yourself. Don't, you know, don't deceive yourself. That's the worst kind. The kind of instructions you can give. In fact, if you are a good friend, good companion, compassionate, kind and caring, you almost have to say, yes, let me get a new tailor for you. <laughs> you know, probably we could find a, find a way to hide your tail. You know, you have to entertain, you have to sort of get along with this friend of yours. And that's what I have to do this three, three days. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Not, not that I myself is not dreaming like this, not having it. I am very much, but 
I have, I have read about it more than you did. <laughs> you understand? So, I have a much, much, much more sophisticated tale. <laughs> so, this sophisticated tale is much more difficult to uh, get rid of than you are blob, you know, you are that. <laughs> you know, you are tale that you have. Actually, it's true. Shall we take a break? Yes, I think we take a break.